In the previous video of this series, we demonstrated how you can use Docker to run Raza. The main point that we made is that we can use Docker to bundle up services. You can have a separate Docker container that represents the action server, for example. And you can also have a separate Docker container for all of the NLU models. And this way you would have bundled services that only needed to communicate with each other. This bundling was the problem that Docker solved for us. We also discussed that although Docker is great, we now have another problem to consider, and that is how to actually orchestrate the communication between all of these separate components. We need something to orchestrate all of these services. So in this video, I would like to dive into this topic a bit further. What I'll do first is I'll just dive into a very basic Rasa deployment. I'll not talk about Rasa X, I'll just look at some of the services that are listed here. And what I would like to do is I would like to use that to figure out what properties we like to have in our orchestration framework. The goal is that by the end of the video, I'll have discussed the need for a tool like Kubernetes when it comes to deploying Raza. So let's talk about a very simple Raza deployment. I'll take inspiration from the standard endpoints.yaml file that Raza provides. And inside of that, we see that we have an action endpoint as well as a tracker store. So let's assume that I have one standard Raza open source container. This has my NLU models as well as my policies. Then I also have an action server, which allows me to run custom Python code. And I will also need something of a tracker. Here I can store the state of my conversations over a longer period of time. Now, what I'll also assume is that there's some place where requests are coming in. So we'll have our users over here that we would like to service, but let's just for argument's sake, consider these three containers that have to scale and interact with each other. It's not a complete deployment, but this will be enough to make a couple of compelling arguments. So let's say that we are in production and everything works fine, but now it seems that our action server is handling a couple of requests that just take a long time. Maybe our action server needs to communicate with a couple of databases and we need to verify if all the communication happened correctly. It might then be the case that we'd like to scale multiple of these action servers. So let's draw that. So let's now say that we also want to have two Raza open source workers where all of our models are running. Well then, if we're going to be scaling all of our services, one thing we got to concern ourselves with is resources. Let's assume that our worker container here needs about four CPUs because it's really compute intensive. And let's also assume that we need four gigabytes of memory because we have a very heavy model, let's say. Then I need the same resources for the second container, but I now also have to start thinking about this action server. Maybe the action server doesn't need that many more resources. Maybe we only need about half a CPU and maybe only 200 megabytes of RAM. And let's suppose that for the tracker, we've got a very similar situation that it's a relatively lightweight Docker container. And that's because the tracker is not really doing anything that's compute intensive. It's more of a database that is really serving. Anyway, let's say that these are the resources that we need. Well, then one kind of deployment that we could consider is we could say, well, let's run all of these containers on a single VM. After all, we have virtual machines in the cloud that we could rent that certainly fit these requirements. We could get a heavy compute node that has 12 CPU cores, as well as 12 gigs of RAM, just to play a bit on the safe side. But there is a problem if we go down this route. It's not that we don't have tools at our disposal. We certainly could use Docker Compose for this, but there's something else to consider here. You see, we might have an application that's communicating to a few users in the beginning, but later on we might get many more users, which in turn might mean that we need another one of these workers as time moves on. If we wanted to facilitate this, we would quickly find ourselves in a situation that we would have to spin up another virtual machine and then move all of these services to that new machine. This theoretically would work, but it certainly might bring some downtime to our assistant, which is something we don't like. We should also acknowledge that doing such a redeployment is a very manual procedure. 
which is also another reason why things might go wrong. There is also another risk. Looking at all these containers, you might think that if a single container goes down, we would still have another container that's able to pick up some of the load. And although that's true, we still have a single point of failure, namely this virtual machine. If for whatever reason our cloud provider has a hiccup and this one single virtual machine goes down, then our entire deployment will go down as well. So although theoretically we could wire everything up inside of a single VM and have all these containers talk to each other with an orchestration tool, one characteristic that we really want to have is we want to have an orchestration tool that can move beyond a single virtual machine. We need some sort of a system that can spread the workload across multiple machines in a fault-tolerant manner, and a single VM is just never going to be able to give that to us. And that's a very important distinction to make early on. And this is one of the primary reasons why we really like Kubernetes. You could run Kubernetes on a single VM, but what you can also do is run it on a cluster of VMs, and that's an insurance policy against this single point of failure scenario that I just described. Another big benefit of Kubernetes is that it's so widely available. Many cloud providers offer many solutions for it, even managed solutions, which means that you as a user of Raza don't need to worry about scaling the entire application. This is something that the cloud provider can pick up on your behalf as well. If we look at Kubernetes, the main thing that we really like about it is the fact that it can scale across multiple VMs. It also comes with great support across cloud providers, but another benefit is that you can also run it on your own hardware. If you have a network with a couple of Linux machines, you could run your own Kubernetes cluster if you wanted to. And this is a relatively common use case in certain industries like finance or healthcare, where you really care where the data is moved to. Now these are all good things, but I do wanna be honest and mention one downside of using Kubernetes, and that is that it is relatively complex. After all, we are dealing with multiple machines and networks, which means that it might be good to invest a little bit in the jargon of Kubernetes. There are certain mental abstractions that Kubernetes provides that make it easier for you to reason about a deployment, but it will be a good idea to invest a little bit in that. So in the next video, I'm going to explain Kubernetes on a somewhat high level, but hopefully enough to make you aware of the abstractions that are available inside of Kubernetes. Understanding how Kubernetes works will also make it much easier for you to deploy Raza and to understand how the scaling is happening. So I'll discuss that in the next video.